Well, the Biden administration, as you've said, has been uh, against the fossil fuel industry, waging war against them, you could argue. Um, and that's born some fruit. Uh, is there any, going to be any reverse from these policies, given the steep increase in prices, 60% in a relatively short period of time? No, unfortunately. I mean, it's like the drug addict that thinks he doesn't take enough drugs, apparently, because there's no <laughs> introspection. There's no examination of, oh, maybe we did something wrong. It's blaming the global markets. It's blaming OPEC. Now we're blaming the oil producers. Biden is blaming. They're saying, well, they didn't ramp up production enough. This guy threatened to throw them in jail. I mean, the chutzpah is just unbelievable. <laughs> and instead, what we're doing is releasing some oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. You know, that what, that's two and a half days worth? That's a finite thing. This is not a solution. So if you're not acknowledging that you're the cause of the problem, you're going to continue causing the problem and cause greater problems. Well, to that issue of releasing this oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, uh, what are some of the consequences? It might give a couple of days relief, like you've said, but are there any negative consequences to taking this action? I mean, the, the main negative consequence is evasion, that they're evading the actual causes. But the other thing is, this is not a crisis in the sense that that reserve is designed for. I mean, that reserve, if it's justified, should really be for things like wartime. Now, wartime, we seem to have forgotten, really depends on low-cost, reliable energy, particularly oil. We seem to think that the only thing we need to do in foreign policy is just encourage other countries not to emit CO2 and fail at that. And then suddenly that's going to protect us while China builds hypersonic and tests hypersonic missiles. Uh, but if, so if this has any purpose at all, it's for wartime. It's for real emergencies. It's not because you mm -hmm. have terrible policies with obvious consequences and then you're upset that voters don't like you for the moment. Well, coming to Australia, as you would be aware, we've just recently signed up to Net Zero with much fanfare and at Glasgow. What can we expect to see in our energy market in the coming years and decades? Well, so th there's no possibility at all that you will, quote, achieve Net Zero, which would just be mass poverty and death if, if you did. So I guess the question is, how close are you going to come to it? And, you know, Morrison and others, they love having these targets that are 30 years in the future that have no specific uh, yeah. commitment now. But even then, it's very, very damaging. I mean, you know, Australia is already suffering massively from opposition to coal. Of course, you have this very irrational opposition to nuclear, and that's only going to increase. Mm. So what you're going to continue to do is subsidize and mandate unreliable solar and wind and keep putting penalties on reliable fossil fuels uh, as well as nuclear. And so you're gonna just see what we keep seeing in Europe and other places. But you know, one thing about Australia that the, has in common with the US is we don't have neighbors to bail us out. So Germany, uh, you know, even some to some extent the UK, like they have neighbors who can bail them out because they're in these interconnected grids uh, in Europe. Denmark is a great example of this, but Australia, you don't have any neighbors that are just gonna give you a ton of electricity if you need it, nor can the U.S. get a ton of electricity from Canada and Mexico. And so we can't deal with nearly as much unreliable electricity uh, as those European countries can. And even with, even with dealing with these neighbors to bail them out, they still have skyrocketing rates. So it's, you're looking at really bad times unless somebody learns the lesson that everyone should be clear on, given that we're a modern economy and we can't produce enough fuel for the winter. That is totally a political failure. That's not a failure of supply and it's not a failure of the ability of industry. And this political failure has consequences across the world. Uh, you've got the West hurting itself deliberately. Uh, what's China doing right now? How are they reacting to uh, all these nations signing up to net zero? Well, you know, on, on a macro scale, I think they're basically laughing because uh, they have a goal of being the world's superpower by 2049. And, you know, they are uh, they're eagerly encouraging us to get off fossil fuels, and they have enough coal plants in development to power Texas three times over. That's just new coal plants, let alone their existing coal plants. But even China is being a victim of this anti-fossil fuel 
a sentiment, you know, they're not committing to reducing their fossil fuels, but they're trying to reduce what's called their emissions intensity. And they've had massive blackouts recently because they're cutting off power in order to meet these arbitrary carbon goals. So even China, the least committed country in the world to emissions, has bought into this anti-fossil fuel mania and they're suffering, but they'll suffer far, far less than we will. Now, uh, let's hear from President Biden. He seems to be avoiding accountability for what's happening in the U.S. with uh, rising gas prices. My effort to combat climate change is not raising the price of gas or increasing its availability. It, what it's doing, it's increasing the availability of jobs. Uh, Alex, is there any truth to that statement? <laughs> I, thank you for sharing that, by the way. I had not seen that quote. That's going on Twitter tomorrow. Um, this is unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, your effort to fight climate change consists of restricting fossil fuels. What did you do the day you went in office? Stopped a pipeline that brings in the exact kind of oil that our refineries can use. What did you do right after that? You banned oil and gas on federal lands, which is a huge portion of our drilling. What do you, like your whole Climate policy is a euphemism. It really means ban fossil fuels and mandate unreliable stuff that people wouldn't freely choose. So it's it's unbelievable the gymnastics that they're going through. The head of the International Energy Agency has also been saying this. So they feel like if they just say words, then we're going to believe them. But it's so obvious. They've restricted supply. The price went up. It's that simple. But... Much of the media does believe them or wants to believe them. So some of the coverage we see here really just does avoid the obvious. Uh, let's hear now from Biden's Secretary of Energy, who can't even give us an estimate for how much oil the US consumes. How many barrels of oil does the US consume per day? I don't have that number in front of me, sir. Now, you would expect someone in that position would know the, that answer. It would not be something that I have to check on and circle back to. Yeah, I mean, you should at least be able to ballpark it. I mean, one way to think of it in the U.S. is just that the average person consumes a little less than three gallons a day, and so you can do the barrel conversion, and it's like about, it ends up being about a billion gallons, and that'll get you to 25 million barrels, which is a little high, so it's really about 20 million barrels. But yes, she should know this, but note that people re regard knowledge of fossil fuels as irrelevant because they have this premise that fossil fuels are unnecessary, and they've had this lie that's been going on that unreliable solar and wind can replace fossil fuels. It's been proven a lie because it hasn't replaced it and that's why the world is scrambling not for more solar panels and wind turbines but for more coal oil and natural gas but alex epstein always a great pleasure to get your insights thanks so much rita